Well, good evening. It's good to see everybody tonight. I know Sunday was Valentine's Day, but I wanted to sing about love tonight. Since I'm singing the special, I got to choose the song. So we're going to do that, all right? Nothing like the love that Christ has for us. Would you stand and join me as we sing 542 if you want to turn to it or you can read it off the screens. Jesus loves even me. I'm told this is Vicki Rumsey's absolute favorite song. <laughs> Here we go. I am so glad. I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Oh, wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Though I forget him, I wander away. Still he doth love me wherever I stray. Back to his dear loving arms when I flee. When I remember that Jesus loves me, I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Oh, if there's only one song I can sing, when in his beauty I see the great King, this shall my song in eternity be. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Oh, I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. When we moved to East Tennessee, the music director had a bad habit of not being ready. And so about 11 o'clock, he'd sit in the front pew and start writing out his music service, wanting to start the music service about 10 after 11. And he sang that song five Sundays in a row. Which at, on the way home that week, my wife said, if I hear that song again, I think she was threatening to hurt the guy. It took a long time to get him into a habit. I finally said to him, Larry, you don't get paid for this week until you give me next week's music service lineup. And if you leave town this week, I'm not giving you your money because this week's job isn't done until next week is ready. He acted like I was a terrorist. But I got him to do what I wanted him to do. And I kept on explaining to him, if you start 10 minutes late, they don't say, Ah, they started 10 minutes late. They say, man, that preacher's long-winded. And I said, I'm not taking a black eye for your being not prepared. So that's why it's not Vicki's favorite song. And to this day, if she'd walked in and we were singing it, she would go. Yes, yeah, stay, stay away from that song. <laughs> Jim Short had back surgery today, and I've heard from his wife a couple times. She, last time she wrote to me, Jim's doing pretty well. This is from Amelia Short. He is in good pain, probably more so if it was not for painkillers. He looks pretty good, ate his dinner, might be released tomorrow. They have to make sure all the numbers are right. Thanks for the prayers. Let the church know we are so grateful for their prayers. And I said, I will share and we will pray. So remember to pray for Jim Short. Sarah Ackley is going to have to go back in. She's had a kidney stone. They broke it up, but it still has not passed. And it's going to be removed um, March 1st. Jim and Betty Ballard are both home. Jim's not feeling well, and he's not felt well for a couple of weeks. Al Loggenrich had a procedure yesterday. Everything went well with that, and they are very happy. Phil Wilson has been in the hospital, had a new pacemaker put in, and he is not recovering well and not getting stronger. Anne is worried about him and asked us if we would pray for him. Five is enough. We'll come back with more later. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the opportunity to meet together tonight to study your word. We pray for these who have been mentioned. For Jim Short, help him as he recovers from this back surgery. We pray that you would give him relief from the pain that he's been enduring for Sarah Ackley, we pray that the stone would pass before they have to go in and remove it. We pray for Jim Ballard, especially with the stomach problems he's having. For Al Log and Rich, we're, we're grateful that these procedures went so well. And we pray for Will, Phil Wilson, that he would gain his strength again. Bless us now as we study your word tonight, as we pray for missionaries and pray for each other. 
In Christ's name, amen. All right, just before we get started, I guess I can do this on Sunday, but I'll give you a little prelude to it so that you can uh, help me out on Sunday. Remember Brother Tim saying that if they uh, postponed or you could convince your wife that Valentine's Day was one or two days, you could get two boxes of candy and two dozen of roses and all that? Well, as he said that, it dawned on me, my wedding anniversary is tomorrow. So I went out and bought two dozen roses, two boxes of candy, so that Mickey will think she really hit the jackpot, see? So I'll see how that goes. Well, we're glad that we've got our missionaries to go over tonight, and we're going to start off with the National Center for Life and Liberty. And uh, this is uh, with David Gibbs III, uh, and we all know uh, CLA was uh, Dr. Gibbs uh, Jr., and uh, we've got this good letter from them from November, and it says, Dear Dr. Rumsey, it's been a while since I wrote all of our supporters, and to be honest, this has been one of the busiest seasons of my life in ministry. I've traveled much less uh, than ever before in my adult life, but I've been working longer hours. Uh, we've seen perhaps the most unprecedented event in our lifetime with the COVID-19, uh, declared a pandemic early in March and has uh, changed the way uh, we, live our, we live our lives. Uh, and it can, and uh, the National Center of Life and Liberty serves churches and ministries across the country. And it says, your, uh, your partnership in prayers and financial support protects vulnerable lives, strengthens churches, and defends the religious liberty of all Americans. In addition to financial coaching, our legal team advises several hundred pastors and churches each week, uh, starting early each morning and ending well into the evening each day. As we watch the medical community work so hard to save lives, my desire has been that the NCLL would be instrumental in saving as many churches as possible with the Lord's help. And then in bold type, it says, we are thankful that you stand with us. Your, uh, your special year-end gifts will continue to help protect you and others like-minded ministries, uh, preventable legal costs for a fraction of the cost of hiring a commercial law firm. Thank you again for your uh, servant leadership in Christ Jesus. May the Lord continue to uphold and protect your faithful ministry. Uh, your friend, uh, David Gibbs III, uh, president of the National Center of Life and Liberty. A good letter. Uh, and uh, we have the uh, date up there, one we've just been supporting a couple of years, two or three years now. Uh, but the Gibbs family has done a wonderful job with CLA and now with the National Center for Life and Liberty. We'll be praying for David III and the work and all the attorneys that they have up there. Okay. Well, as I go over this letter, we've got the Nunez family, and uh, Jim's loaded up several uh, photos, maybe six, seven, or eight. So as I'm reading, uh, you'll be able to follow, and they're in West Africa in Cape Verde, and it says 2021. Uh, it has been since last year that we were able to communicate with you all. Still, we have not ceased to pray for you and praise the Lord uh, for your lives, helping us to serve the Lord Jesus Christ here in Cape Verde. While uh, it says, allow us to summarize what has taken place uh, in this past year, uh, now as we uh, are into the month of February here in West Africa. It says, while we were out, the armed forces men and local men uh, were able to finish the soccer field, and uh, that is actually uh, AstroTurf uh, that they have there. And uh, they make a comment in the letter, uh, of course, being in West Africa, they may not have those uh, uh, tied little balls that you can throw in a washing machine like we do here, but it says the moms are very appreciative because there's no grass stains. Uh, so they've got that soccer field there and they're very happy with that. And as I said, it says uh, the wives really appreciate it 
uh, not having to work so hard uh, on, on the laundry. And it goes on to say that they've had the ladies' meetings, and uh, you'll see a couple of pictures there of that. Uh, for the first time, Anna has held the ladies' meeting. Uh, needless to say, it was a huge blessing for the ones that came from the city as well as those who came uh, from the villages. Uh, the Saturday afternoon was filled with praises and uh, singing praises to the Lord, and for that we are very happy. Fun fellowship in a moment in the Word, not to mention the goodies uh, that were provided for. And then they have some prayer requests uh, for their son, uh, Joseph Neal, who is a student right now here in Florida at Pensacola Christian College up at Pensacola. Uh, pray for the ministry uh, to the armed forces to be able to resume. And then pray for the upcoming camp meeting in March. So when we have prayer in a moment, we'll be remembering those uh, special dates. And it says, thank you again for your financial support and prayer, the Nunezes. And so uh, a good letter. Always like to see the pictures. It makes it a little bit easier to see what they're doing. And we thank the Lord uh, for the Nunezes. We'll be praying for them uh, this week, doing a great job for the Lord there in West Africa. Our final one is uh, Arlen and Alana uh, Payne. And uh, we've received this letter from the fall of the year. And it says, Dear Pastor Rumsey and Church, the psalmist sang, sing praises to God and sing praises, sing praises unto our King, sing praises for God is the King of all the earth, sing praises with understanding. God reigneth over uh, the heathen, God sitteth on the throne of his holiness, Psalm 47, 6 and 5. In the midst of troublesome times, our hearts are praising him, for we are assured that he is the king over all, and he still is in control, and we all say amen to that. Uh, we are currently uh, under a safe order at home, and of course they're ministering to the Seminole Indians uh, down uh, here in Florida, and uh, I've actually been down where they've worked before, and it says that uh, the Seminole uh, community seems to be uh, susceptible to the virus. It says, look, uh, lockdowns do not apply to the Holy Spirit who has not stopped working or moving about the communities. We have had blessings and seen three souls receive Christ uh, since the shutdown. We ask you to join us in our rejoicing and continue to pray for God to use us. Uh, we are thankful for your continued financial support uh, of our ministry during these very difficult times. Uh, thanks to your faithfulness uh, and the faithfulness of God to supply, our needs continue to be met. God bless you, uh, Arlen and Alana Payne, in a good letter working with the Seminole Indians here in Florida. Uh, who will be praying for them. We've been supporting them now over 25 years. Okay. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll remember each of these requests uh, that we've uh, shared with you tonight. So let's bow together uh, for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we bow before you, Lord, and we want to thank you for these three missionaries that we're emphasizing tonight. We thank you for Brother David Gibbs III with the National Center for Life and Liberty. Thank you for that great work. And as he asks us to pray that uh, he's working longer, not traveling as much, but working longer. And as he uh, tries to keep religious liberty uh, for all Americans and churches here. And Lord, we just pray that you'd bless them with their financial coaching uh, of different churches and pastors. And Lord, for the Nunezes, we thank you for them and their faithfulness to you. We just pray, Lord, for their son, Joseph, who's at uh, Pensacola and for the ministry to reopen with the armed forces and the upcoming camp meeting in March. We just pray that you'd bless them. And Lord, for the pains, we pray, uh, Lord, as they minister to the Indians and for these three that were recently saved, I pray, Lord, that you'd bless them and encourage them in their new walk with the Lord and pray that you'd open the doors for others to be saved. Just pray now that you'd be with us through the remainder of this service as Brother Jim leads the music and as Pastor brings the message tonight. And we pray now for these three missionaries in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you join me on 555, and if you would stand.
I think Vicki would like this song. We often look at this as being a kid's song, but there's some awesome doctrine built into this little song that we all, if you were in church as a youngin, sang when you were younger. Uh, just some great, great doctrine. Would you join me as we sing, Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, he who died, heaven's gate to open wide. He will wash away my sin, let his little child come in. Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, he will stay close beside me all the way. He has prepared a place for me. And someday his face I'll see. Here we go. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Well, take a few minutes. Do an air handshake tonight if you will. Let folks know you're glad to see them. His grace is as deep as the deepest sea. His mercy still flows from an old rugged tree. His love, sweet love, it amazes me. When I think of how he reached down one happy day at an old-fashioned altar where I knelt down to pray, I got up on my knees, I was changed and made do. What he did for me, he'll do for you. His love, sweet love, it amazes me. His grace is as deep as the deepest sea. His mercy still flows from an old rugged tree. His love, sweet love, it amazes me. What a blessing to know I am free and made whole. I've been washed in his blood, made much whiter than snow. So don't think it's strange if I praise his dear name. His love rescued me and I'll not be the same. His love, sweet love, it amazes me. His grace is as deep as the deepest sea. His mercy still flows from an old rugged tree. His love, sweet love, it amazes me. I just have to praise Him or the rocks will cry out. As long as I live, I will sing and I'll shout. I'll tell this old world of the love that He gave. This will be the theme of my song. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. His love, sweet love, it amazes me. His grace is as deep as the deepest sea. His mercy still flows from an old rugged tree. His love, sweet love, it amazes me. His love, sweet love, His love, it amazes me. Also remember, pray for Wilma Armstrong with cancer, Kathy Dean's fighting her cancer, Duranta Smith has been in the hospital a couple of times, D. Smith, 
uh, with some stomach issues. Her parents, Al and Peggy Myers, both for health. Martha Cobb has been in the hospital and she is now home. Les Heath, his wife, Laura. Les is a real fall, tall fellow, sits over here. It's Betty Ballard's cousin. Both he and his wife have COVID. Also pray for Ivan Mace, Helen Holstein, and Eddie Busby, and then Paul Hargett. Paul was in the hospital a couple months ago, uh, had some kidney stones, and he has not walked since then. Paul's about 45, maybe 48, special needs. And uh, his dad passed away a couple years ago, and dad was a big part of Paul's life, and he misses him a lot. Luke chapter 18. We're going to look at a blind man who had insight. Verse 35. It came to pass that as he, speaking of Jesus, was come nigh into Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the way, wayside begging. Now Luke calls him a certain blind man. Mark in chapter 10 and verse 46 calls him Bartimaeus. So we know his name, but not in the book of Luke. Verse 36, And hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passes by. And he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they which before rebuked him that he should hold his peace, he cried so much the more, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, What wilt thou that I do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said, Receive thy sight. Thy faith has saved thee. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise unto God. Now the preface of the story is back a few verses from verse 31 through verse 35. Actually, 31 34 is closer to it. And it's easy for us to understand, but it seemed to go right by what, the, 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 what was said went by the disciples unnoticed. It may have been that this story of blind Bartimaeus overtook what the Lord said in chapter 18, verse 31. Here we write, read. Then he took up the 12 and said, Behold, we go to Jerusalem. And all the things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, spitefully entreated, spit it on. And they shall scourge him, put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. And they understood none of these things, as this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which they were spoken. I find it fascinating that Jesus, the Son of God, would tell these people what's going to happen, and then the Holy Spirit would hide it from them. They got to hear it, and then they just forgot it. They didn't remember the words of Jesus when he was arrested a few days later. They didn't remember the words when he was tried, tortured, killed, nor when he rose from the dead. But in Jericho, the last major city before they got in Jerusalem, Jesus said, this is what's going to happen. We're going to Jerusalem, and this is, it's going to take place. And Bartimaeus was from Jericho, and his job was sitting by the roadway, called a highway. <clears throat> Do you know why roads are called highways? Because the Romans, when they would build a roadway, would build it up. They would also sculpt it to where water hit and would run off gently. And they raised the roadbeds so the roadbeds would not be washed away. And it became known as a highway. And so we today have highways. And if you'll notice... The best highways are those that are raised a little bit. When a highway gets low, it gets filled with water, and it's too exciting to drive on. So they are high. They are raised. Raised roads, highways. Now in Luke chapter 18, verse 35, we see the man's condition. He's blind. That's a serious handicap. His circumstance was that he's a beggar. Now the reason he's a beggar is because he's blind. He's not homeless. He's not really unemployed. He's kind of self-employed. But in reality, he's unemployable. Because as a blind man, he's the things he can't do which need to be done to work. 
Years ago, we had an Ethiopian live with us for, uh, it was either 10 weeks or two months, I don't know. Mrs. Vic brought this Ethiopian over to America and then hurt her knee. And I don't know if she had knee surgery, but I know that she dropped him off at our house and his name was Abetta, and he lived with us for a long time. It was interesting having an Ethiopian live with me. I came home one day and he was doing me a favor, mowing the grass. Now, when I mow the grass, I mow a line here and a line there and a line there and a line there. He mowed the grass by going, oh, there's a long spot. There's a long spot over there. <laughs> I have never seen a, a worse lawn mowing job in my life. And he took my brand new white tennis shoes to mow the grass. And by the time he was done, my white shoes were green. I don't think they ever did become ungreen. A better was amazed by America. He was really amazed in grocery stores at the choices that we have. He would say to me, how do you know what cereal to choose that we know what we like? So we just go to that one. He said, in my country, you choose the one they have or you choose none. He said, because if they have one kind of cereal, you thank God for it. And I said, what if that means, what, what if they only have shredded wheat? He said, you eat shredded wheat, I'd starve. I don't like shredded wheat. When it comes to breakfast cereal, I like what I like and I don't want anything else. He would also say things to me like this. He said, in America, you have sidewalks and almost no one walks. Now, we did not live in Gibsonton because everybody in Gibsonton walks. But for the most place, we have sidewalks and people walk, if they do walk, for exercise. No one walks to go anywhere. But we have sidewalks. He also said, in America, you have handicapped parking spots everywhere, and the people that use the handicapped spots don't even look handicapped. In my country, you can tell when someone's handicapped. It's, he's right. I've had people tell me, you just can't tell someone's handicapped. Well, yeah, well, if your leg's missing, you can tell. If you're blind, you can tell. This man's condition, his blindness, his circumstance, he's a beggar. His chance at healing and sight is coming right now because Jesus is on the way. His call was for mercy. His commitment was he's going to call for help in spite of people around him telling him to hush. His cure, he was saved from blindness and from sin by faith. And his consistency is he's following the Lord after salvation. That's the entire sermon. Let's pray and go home. That's my, I like my outline there. I come up with that one on my own. I thought, I'm just going to go ahead and give it. And if I give it, I mean, what else is there to say? Well, I'll try to find something. For Bartimaeus, this was a day of hope. And it's a day of hope for one reason only. In verse 37, Jesus is passing by. Bartimaeus has endured a life without hope of betterment. He's got a life where there is no hope for change. The blackness of blindness had invaded his life. It had engulfed him. It had affected every area of his life. In my opinion, blindness would be a very difficult handicap to bear. I've known deaf and I've known blind. And if I had to be given a choice, God said to me, you're going to go deaf or you're going to go blind. I'll choose deafness right now. I'll, I'll figure out how to communicate. I'll, read, I'll learn to read lips. I'll, I'll learn sign language. But I want my eyesight because of the freedom that eyesight gives me, the ability to, to discern danger, the ability for accomplishment in life. The, the deaf can work jobs. The blind can't work. And the deaf folks that we have known did work. They could find jobs. There's some things they couldn't do. I had a deaf man in the last church who was a pretty good mechanic. He put his hand on a motor. And then it signed to me, got a miss. And he, he, he could find out where it was by putting his hand on the motor. I was amazed at the things the deaf could do. Would you ever consider going to a barber who's deaf? Who cares, right? Would you like a blind barber? Mm, nah, I'll, I'll pass on the blind barber. How about have a bus driver that's deaf? That's a handicap. He won't be able to hear a siren. But a I get on a bus with a deaf driver, blind driver. 
Nah. Blind cashier? Think of the challenge of a blind cashier. You give them a $20 bill. How do they know it's a $20 bill? They can do change, but they got to have some help with certain things. The blind cashier would have to rely on the honesty of shoppers. And people steal from stores all the time. Tell you a story. My neighbor is a loss prevention specialist at CVS. He works other side, over in the other county, Pinellas County. About 10 years ago, he and I were talking, end of the year, and I said, what kind of work did you do? And he told me, and I said, uh, do you have a lot of loss? He said, well, one of our stores, the stores where he was at, had a $6 million profit and a $6 million loss from theft in the year previous. I don't know how many stores it were, but this is what he, so they had $12 million in profit and $6 million was lost. And I said, man, that's a lot of shoplifting. He said, that's not shoplifting. It's an employee theft. And I said, how? He said, with these scanners, employees can put their hand over the code and sweep the thing right over the thing. And he says, and it won't, it doesn't show. He said, the camera's above. Don't pick it up. He said, so we've had to go and we've looked at and have to count the number of items that were purchased and the number of items that were rang up. And they figured out that year that they lost $6 million dollars from employee theft. So then they went, I said, well, what's the the solution to it? He said, put a a light up there. Not only is there a beeper, you know, when you you bring that thing, it beeps. Also, there's a light that flashes, and the light that flashes so the cameras can tell if you're actually cheating. If you go to Walmart and you do your own, or Home Depot and you do your own checkout, there's a camera right above you. They're checking the number of things that are beeped because of theft. Bartimaeus, most of the blind in that day and era, has been robbed of the opportunity to work in order to provide for his own needs. Now, we don't know if he had a family. We don't know if his family had needs. We don't know if he had a wife or children. But we do know that the only thing he can do for work is sit on the corner, sit in the way by the gate and beg. Blindness creates permanent poverty. It would have been really easy to slip into despair. I tried to help somebody years ago just fighting with depression. And they said to me, the thing that depresses me the most is the realization that nothing is going to change. Hopeless. Talking about their marriage, talking about their family, that hopelessness was really depressing. This man, Bartimaeus, is blind. There is no ophthalmologist. There's no optometrist. There's no eye doctor. There's there's no science of eyes at all. He's blind physically. His blindness have left him helpless and without hope. He's broke financially, and he has no job and no hope of doing better because he couldn't do the work required to have a job because he's blind. And so he's going to live the rest of his life begging. And if he makes anything at all, he'd be lucky. In the midst of this hopelessness, this despair, he hears Jesus is coming. The day of hope for blind Bartimaeus became a day of activity. And instead of forsaking his opportunity, instead of being fatalistic, instead of being depressed and feeling sorry for himself, he seized an opportunity. He used the opportunity of Jesus passing by to call for Christ, and he exercised faith, and it began with listening. If you don't have eyes, you learn to listen. You learn to listen well. We had a blind man live at our house. Once again, the Vicks brought a blind man to the country to help raise money from Ethiopia. And he was at our house. Uh, my kids were young. Alicia's around three years old. And she kept waiting for him to take the black off. And she says, when does he take the black off? And Alicia, that's his skin color. 
She, she referred to him as the man in black. Now, my wife had a thing about moving furniture. That's not fair for blind people. When he was at our house the first time, everything was set up, and he remembered where everything was. He comes back a few weeks later, and we, she and I are in the bedroom, and we hear this, Vicky, 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 and he's about two-thirds of the way sit down, and he can't find the chair. And he said, you don't move furniture when blind men live with you. It's a great disadvantage to be blind, but when you have one disability, it doesn't make your other abilities better or sharper. It trains you to be in tune. And you become very good at other skills like listening. He could not see, but he could hear. And so he used what he had. He had ears to hear with. He has a mouth to speak with. <clears throat> he responds to what he hears by asking people, what's going on? There's a crowd gathering, and he realizes there's more people here than usual. And so he begins to ask. He inquires, and someone says, Jesus is coming this way. It's obvious by his reaction that Jesus, excuse me, that Bartimaeus already knew who Jesus was. And he had been waiting for Jesus. He recognized the position. The Lord is the Messiah. And he's thinking to himself, this man can give me hope. This man can change my life. Not only had Bartimaeus heard about Jesus, he believed that Jesus was the answer to his problem. And his problem? Blindness. And the answer? He believed that Jesus could do for him what he needed to be done. I tell you all the time, it's one of my favorite principles in life. What you believe determines how you behave. If you believe Jesus can heal your blindness, you want Jesus to come your way. So you call, and it's exactly what he did, verse 38. He cried out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. You know, the sad truth is that handicapped people are often treated as children. Sometimes handicapped people are treated as if they're not even there. I've been in doctor's offices where a handicapped person was ignored or they were spoken around. Even when they're adults, even when they're very much present, someone with a handicap can be disrespected. I don't think that people do it on purpose. There's just... There's really something odd about people's mindset. Several years back, my voice went bad. Remember, I had surgery on my vocal cords, and I was told to not speak. I think it was three weeks. It seemed like three months. We got tired of being home, and so I was, I was actually communicating with Vicky on an iPad, and I had a program where I could really fast. So I said, let's go to the, go to the mall. We go to the mall, we walk in Dillard's, and... We, we, and I get separated. And the lady comes up to me and says, can I help you? And I said, I can't talk. She went, oh! Is there something I can show you? I'm not deaf. I can't talk. And I can't say, I can't talk. Okay. Vicky walks up, saved me. And I said it later, I said, she doesn't know the difference between can't talk and deaf. But it happens all the time. People that are handicapped in some way are misunderstood. When, when this man cried out for help, he was treated like a child. Mark 10, 48 says, Many charged him he should hold his peace. Shh! Quiet! That's the way you treat a child. The Lord's coming. Be quiet. He wouldn't have it. He cried the more a great deal. Son of David, have mercy on me. Now, the, the Lord didn't come to him. The Lord heard him calling and said, bring him to me. And it says, he wasn't being quiet. Why? Because he believed that the Lord could give him sight. Therefore, he behaved the way he did, being really loud. 
He didn't even know the Lord was physically close enough to hear his cries. How would he know? All he, all he knew is that there was a lot of people around. And the more people around, the less likely the Lord was to hear him cry out. And so he cried out the more. And he cried out louder. And he did it over and over again. Before the Lord called for Bartimaeus to come see him, Bartimaeus has already gone through a significant change in his life. We don't know because we're not told the story. If Bartimaeus had been hoping for years the Lord had come by, or if he realized all at once, Jesus is here and I'm here, he's my only hope. But at that moment, he was not going to be denied. He changed his thinking. Instead of concentrating on himself, which is very natural, instead of thinking about his own needs, which were legitimate, he's blind, he's dirt poor, he's a beggar, he began concentrating on the presence of someone else. In response to the crowd noise and the commotion, he had an awareness of the presence of other people and then was told of the presence of Christ. And once he heard about the presence of Christ, he no longer focused on the presence of other people, but he focused on the presence of Jesus. Now, in your world, there are lots of people. They're around you all the time. You can concentrate on yourself, or you can concentrate on other people, or you can concentrate on the Lord. One of those will change your life. The other might be good for you. Thinking about other people is wonderful. Thinking about yourself, it's done way too much in our world. All you really need to do in order to not serve the Lord is think about yourself. Just put your first, yourself first. And you, for too long, you won't serve the Lord at all. You won't serve others either. He began to pray. His prayer was persistent because his need was persistent. He had a blindness that was not going away. It affected every area of his life and it affected him negatively. His prayer was penitent. Have mercy on me. It was repeated over and over again. It was persistent. The guy's got a persistent blindness and a persistent prayer and a persistent attitude. He... he he doesn't want to be denied, and so he just continues over and over again, calling out. He doesn't know how near close the Lord is, and so he'll call out, call out, call out, just hoping beyond hope that the Lord hears him. His pertinent and persistent need produced a pertinent and persistent prayer. You know how to tell how something's really important to you? How often do you pray about it? The things that are really important to you, you pray about a lot. He received an answer. Jesus stopped walking. He didn't know. There's no way for him to know that Jesus has stopped walking. Jesus stood still. There's no way for him to know. Jesus spoke. Still, there's no way for him to know. Because Jesus didn't speak to him. He spoke to others. Verse 49, he gives a command. He stood still and commanded him to be called. Now, he's on the Lord's radar, but he doesn't know it yet because he's blind. And there's noise and there's people. And so, the command was followed by a response. They called the blind man and said... Be of good comfort. Rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. So why did he cast away the garment? If you know anything about clothing in that era, they would have wraps and cloaks, and it's the outer garment. He, listen, folks, if he can get the blindness cured, that old coat he's wearing, probably a rag, he'll be able to replace real soon. So he just throws off the, the, the robe and heads out to find Jesus being led by someone else. Verse 51 shows us a question. 
Jesus answered and said to him, What will thou I should do unto thee? Followed by an answer. Lord, that I might receive my sight. And then a statement happens, verse 52, it's from the Lord. Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. It's followed by a response. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Now here's something interesting. For Bartimaeus, this man with great insight, going his way meant following the Lord Jesus. That's a really nice thought. If Jesus Christ saves you, your faith, he accepts your faith as salvation, from that point on, to go your way ought to be, I'm following the Lord Jesus. Wherever he goes, I'll go. Whatever he said to do, I'll do. I'm going where he's going. I like what he's done for me. This brief moment in time was an hour of hope. It was a time of activity. And it's also an hour of crisis because Jesus was passing by. You know, there are some things in life that if you don't do at the right moment, you don't do. I was told a story today of a young mother who went to a preacher and asked for help with her son who has gotten mouthy and he got to where he wouldn't obey. And the preacher said, well, how old is your son? And she said, 16. He didn't get mouthy on his 16th birthday. He had been mouthy probably for 10 years and she'd been letting it go. If you're still a parent and you've got kids and they challenge you to a fight, don't disappoint them. Give them a fight. Stand up to them. Oh, I don't want my children to not like me. Forget that. They'll love you when they're older if you make them obey you when they're young. I used to tell my boys, especially, you fight your mother, it's going to be an all-star wrestling match, a handicap match. We're going to tie one hand behind your back, and then your mother and I are going to tag team you, and we're going to beat you half to death. But you're not going to win this. You will not win in arguing against your parents. They didn't think it was funny. I thought it was hilarious. They got the point. You fight your mother, you fight your father. A boy's got about 13, both of them. Their mother tell him what to do, and they'd ignore her. And I would go. I didn't have to say really, I'd just look at them. And they would get up and do what she was, she was told to do. And she would just seethe. And I would say, you need me. <laughs> you really need me. I did it today. We, we got a really nice letter from the Social Security Administration in her name. And it said, if you retire at first opportunity, we're going to give you $1,100 a month. I opened it up, I showed it to her, and I said, read this. And as she read it, I said, you need me. <laughs> because without me, you're going to starve. Because <laughs> I'm going to make a lot more than that because she spent 10 years raising kids, not working. I got a real head start on her on Social Security stuff. <sighs> it's great being needed. <laughs> We, what we found when we raised our kids was the younger they were, the more they needed mama. And the older they became, the more they needed daddy. And we went through this transition. She didn't like it, but it was a good transition. Because when they were younger, I was inept anyway. I don't know what to do with a baby. I know what to do with a teenager. Sometimes you tell them what to do. Sometimes you beat them up. Sometimes you love them. And there's all, all sorts of things you can do with teenagers. I understood teenagers. I don't understand kids. To this day, you don't see teenagers hanging around my wife, do you? Little kids, though. Man, they, they love her. I still like teenagers. I think teenagers are pretty cool. I like them in middle school. I like them in high school. College, not so much. Yeah. Let me make some applications and we'll close this thing down. 
Bartimaeus is like an average man in that he needed what Jesus could do for him. Everybody needs what Jesus can do for them. But he's not like an average man because although he knew what the Lord could do for him and he knew he needed what the Lord could do for him, he was not ashamed to admit that he needed the Lord. And the average man today is afraid, ashamed to admit it. You need what the Lord can do for you and you need to admit that the Lord can do for you what you need done. Bartimaeus' blindness represents the sin that affects an average man's life. Did I, good, up on that screen it's right, I made a change here and I got Bartimaeus, I took the word Bartimaeus blindness out and I got Bartimaeus blindness. But since it doesn't, you wouldn't even know it if I hadn't explained that to you. Sin brings limitations, brings difficulties, eventually destruction. Jesus passing by pictures an opportunity that sinners have to call on him for help. The brief time in the life of Bartimaeus as Jesus was passing by is representative of our life, which is fleeting and passing. We all know that we may not be here tomorrow. A rather famous man died today. If you hadn't heard yet, Rush Limbaugh passed away after about a year with lung cancer. I did some reading tonight just about his life and death, and I'm just amazed at how mean people can be at the death of others. I, I know there's meanness on the right side of the political spectrum, but I don't believe the, rightness, the meanness on the right side of the political spectrum is anything comparable to the meanness on the left side of, of the political spectrum. I, I, I don't understand why people act this way. I say I don't understand. I understand their hearts are dark. I just, I can't imagine why. I mean, if someone that disagrees with me politically passes away, why would I be mean? Why would I say anything? Not too long ago, what, about a year ago, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away. She's a brilliant woman. And I read some of her court decisions, and I don't know that I've ever agreed with her on any decision that she made. She was very pro-abortion. She was asked one time, suggesting a country that might have a, you know, what would they use? What, what would she suggest a country use for their political documents to, to run their country? And she came up with either the South African con uh, Constitution or the Venezuelan Constitution. She didn't say the U.S. Constitution. That offended me. I thought, what kind of person sits on the Supreme Court of the United States and doesn't honor our Constitution? But when she died, I said, I'm sorry. It's sad. I, I, I don't believe Ruth Bader Ginsburg knew the Lord as her Savior. I, I can't say for certain, but judging what her religious background was, judging what her behavior was, I, I doubt that she knew the Lord. I wouldn't dance on her grave. I wouldn't be happy that she's in hell or if I thought that. The, the stuff said about Rush Limbaugh today, shameful. And it will not stop until people on that side of the aisle demand it stop. So, next slide tells us things you, you know pretty well. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. Thou knowest not what the day bring forth. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Some years ago I saw a movie called The Last of the Mohicans. It's kind of a downer story, but the music in it is just tremendous. And the storyline is that there's a British commander who has two daughters and he, they have alliances with Americans and with the British and Indians and one of the Indian tribes turns against him, kick, kidnaps his two daughters. And the Mohicans, there's three of them, are chasing after the Iroquois. The two daughters both have 
romantic relations with the, the last of the Mohicans' sons. I think he was the last one, but any, at any rate, one of the young ladies has been kidnapped, and while her boyfriend, husband, whatever he was, is coming to get her, she gets so depressed that she simply commits suicide by walking off a cliff. And the Indian, the Iroquois goes, and they, and they walk on. Life is a vapor. It's here, and poof, it's gone. We honestly do not know whether today will be our last opportunity to serve the Lord. If you don't know him as Savior, you honestly don't know if this would be your last opportunity to meet him. We should treat every day as if it were our last and maybe even our only opportunity to serve Jesus. <clears throat> we should do what blind Bartimaeus did. We should realize our condition. See, you, you're not <clears throat> blind physically, but without Christ, you're blind spiritually. You should re recognize the Creator. The only one that can cure your need is Jesus Christ. And third of all, you should reach out to him in faith for his help. God be merciful to me, a sinner. He didn't say that, but he said, God be merciful to me. And Jesus took it that way, told him his faith and saved him, gave him his sight back. If we fail to act or react as Bartimaeus, it may be that we're more blind than he. If we fail to see the need of Christ, we're more blind to our condition than the blind man was to his condition. He knew he was blind physically. If you don't know you're blind spiritually, you're worse off than he is. Failure to recognize the hopelessness of our condition means that we're blind to our creator. Bartimaeus had an opportunity to meet Jesus Christ. He heard from the crowd that he's coming his way and he did not miss the opportunity. Failure to reach out to the Savior is a sign that your blindness is spiritual. So which is worse? Physical blindness or spiritual blindness? Well, one lasts earth and the other lasts eternity. If you don't know Christ as Savior, in a sense, you're worse off than blind Bartimaeus. But the answer is the same. The answer is found in Jesus Christ. Well, Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to come study your word, learn about these characters that are obscure, unknown, sometimes unnamed. Luke didn't even bother to name Bartimaeus. Mark did. We're grateful that you, even on the way to Jerusalem, knowing that you're going to be sold, arrested, tried, beaten, spat upon, killed, with that on your mind, when you hear someone crying out to have mercy on them, you stopped. You put your mind off yourself, and you put your mind on Bartimaeus. As Bartimaeus was stopping thinking about himself to think about you, you were stopping to think about him. What a good way to have a great story with us thinking about Christ as Christ thinks about us. Thank you for this man's example. We might assume that this, this man was blind for a reason, and that reason was that we could learn the importance of having Christ in our life. 
Thank you for him. Thank you for his faith. Thank you for his persistence. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Have a good night. Eight o'clock.